first I briefly explain what is counseling compared to teaching. Many people think we want to change someone, we have to teach, we tell them. Now it's true. There are two kinds of people that we come across. There are some people who want to learn and then you can teach. When some people want to learn, like now I'm teaching. Because you want to learn, then I can teach. Now when do we use counseling? Counseling is for helping people who might not be willing because they have to change something. We want to find out where they are and we want to guide them. I use an illustration. If a couple come to us and the, couple's, the couple is fighting, they're yelling at each other and they, they're even trying to get a divorce. They come to us. And then if the pastor just say forgive each other, pray together and then go home and bless each other, help each other, don't go to divorce and uh, God doesn't like divorce and then go home and the couple is not going to change because they have real problem. We have to guide them to help them to realize the problem and how the problem will affect them and how they can change. So we want to, uh, when we do counseling, is helping people who are not so willing so that they understand the importance of, uh, the, importance of uh, the change. And also when they help, like someone want to serve God, we want to talk to them to understand where they are, to understand uh, uh, what's the spiritual condition and how we can help them. Then we need counseling. And even preaching, we can use a counseling skill. If you notice my preaching, sometimes I will ask questions. I will lead people to think. Then I'm using counseling skills. I'm not just straightforward telling you what to do, but I will explain and I will use illustration. I will guide you. I will ask you questions to, to think. But now I'm not in a real situation, uh, so I don't ask questions as much. But if I'm in a real situation, very often I will ask people, what do you think about that? And, and when someone is unhappy, what, how, uh, how do you respond to them? So I ask questions. It's, this is uh, part of counseling skill. Okay, now, examples of counseling skills in the Bible. What I want to say is counseling is not just a, uh, a secular skill. It was found in the Bible too. Okay, the woman with the 12-year bleeding touched Jesus and she was afraid to admit that that she touched Jesus and uh, and then Jesus said to her take heart daughter your faith has healed you so Jesus did not accuse her and responded to her feelings and made her feel comforted now one important element of counseling is feel the feeling of the person and responding to the feeling of the person so Jesus would respond to her feeling by saying, take heart, don't worry, relax. I care about your feeling. I, I know that you are not feeling uh, happy. I, I know that you feel uh, guilty. You're not feeling good. So take heart, don't worry. So this is responding to the feeling to comfort her. And daughter, this is to comfort her too. To let her know that Jesus regard her as a daughter that she is precious in Jesus, that, that Jesus cares about her. So to comfort her, to make her feel comfortable. And then your faith has healed you. When you trust in me, I will bless you, I will help you. So it's not how much you work. And then the next example is Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me more than this? Jesus guided Peter to think about his life before Jesus commissioned him. So here, um, Jesus asked uh, Peter three times, do you love me more than this? Why did he ask? First, why did he ask? He asked so that uh, he would think, Peter would think whether I really love Jesus. And then the second time when Jesus asked him, so he'll think again, do I really love Jesus? And then the third time when Jesus asked him, he would say, do I really love him? Maybe there was some problem of mine. Maybe I, I don't really love him because I denied him three times. So do I have real problem? Do I have to handle this? Actually, you know, nobody's love is perfect. So we all 
love Jesus to a certain extent if we are real Christians. So when Jesus asked him three times, it would raise his awareness of his level of love and it would motivate him to love Jesus more. So this is what we want to do, is to uh, help people to think about their life, to evaluate their life so that they would work on their life to, to improve. Okay, and then the next example, the woman caught in adultery. Didn't, Jesus did not accuse the woman caught in adultery. Jesus said to her, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? The woman said, no. Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus guided her to be aware of her sin without making her feel bad. So Jesus did not accuse her, but just ask her, where are those accusers of yours? Now Jesus is not saying it's okay for you to sin, but Jesus asked her because that's her, her concern. Is there someone who accused her? So where are those accusers? Has no one condemned you? So no one condemns you. This woman said no. And then uh, Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. So he responded to her need of forgiveness. Go and sin no more. And then he, Jesus uh, tried to change her, that to change her so that he will uh, want to obey God and not to fall into sin again. So Jesus used this method to guide her to think to think about her sins. And then when Jesus first saw Peter, and then Jesus told Peter to cast a net to the right side, and then he caught a lot of fish, and then Peter said to Jesus, Be, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So Peter at that time was feeling very guilty, so he said, Depart from me, I am a guilty man. And then Jesus comforted him and said, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So Jesus responded with, to her, his feeling. He was afraid. So he said, Don't be afraid. So Jesus detected that he had fear. So Jesus said, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And then Jesus responded by raising up his self-image. You are important. I will use you. I will raise you up so one day you can catch men instead of fish. So here Jesus was guiding him not to feel, continue to feel guilty, but to feel forgiven and also to have believed that his life would go higher and higher. Now this is another example of counseling. It's Jonah. Jonah was angry that God did not punish the people of Nineveh. God guided him first by providing a plan that gave Jonah a shade. Then Jonah was very happy. Then God prepared a worm to kill the plant, and Jonah became very angry. God guided him by asking him whether it was right for him to be angry about the plant. Jesus uh, said, uh, he was right, he said, he said, uh, not was. Jonah said he was right that that even if I'm angry to death, I'm right. Then God confronted him, Jonah, by asked, telling him that we care about, he cared more about himself than the numerous people in Nineveh. He said, you did not plant this plant. You did not cause it to grow. And it came one night, and then you are so angry because of the plant. How about the people there? There's so many people there that, um, that there are so many people there who cannot discern the right hand from the left hand. So there are many more people there. So why don't you see these people and see their need? So Jonah must have been convinced. That's why he wrote that down in the book of Jonah. He wrote down what God said to him to change him. So God guided him step by step to guide him to change. So counseling is basically guiding people to change. It's not just teaching. So Jesus, uh, God did not just start with saying, there are so many people there, I have to care about them. God did not just start with that. He, he started with uh, uh, planting, the, sending the seed, and then letting the seed grow, and then later killing the, uh, the seed so that, Nineveh, uh, so that Jonah uh, 
suffer because of the son. And then when he suffered, he was very angry. But he did not think of the people who would be dying in Nineveh. So God told him that, you know, so ask him. So God used questions to guide him. <clears throat> so uh, is it right for you to be angry? And, and Jonah said, yes, it's right for me to be angry even unto death. But then Jesus said, but then this plan you didn't see, but plan, but this, all these people you don't care. So God guided him step by step to, to have compassion. And then number six, John 16, 13. However, when the, he, the Holy Spirit of truth, the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit guides people by counseling them to change. He does not command or force people to change. Many people reason with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit guide them to change. So the Holy Spirit counsel us. So I want to ask you this question. When we have sinned, does the Holy Spirit yell at us? Does the Holy Spirit just teach us to change? Like when we want to lie or when we have lied or when we have lust. So the Holy Spirit will move in our heart to let us know this is wrong. To let us know this is that we feel uh, uncomfortable. At the same time, we feel the love from God to move in our heart. And then that love moves us to repent. So from the Holy Spirit, we realize that God doesn't use force to change us. He doesn't just tell us to change. But He is very gentle. He's very gentle to move in our heart to change us. So God is using counseling skill. And sometimes people argue with God, I have to do this, I have to do that because of this situation. And then God will guide them to understand why he should follow God. <laughs> and then number 7, John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice and know them, and they follow me. Jesus' voice counsels people to change. So also Jesus speaks to our heart and guides us to change. So that's the voice of the Holy Spirit moving uh, and the voice of Jesus in our heart to move us to change. Okay, now help counseling is helpful for helping people spiritually. So when we talk with people to help them spiritually, it's good to use counseling skills, not just teaching. Uh, many pastors have the tendency to teach because they think that, you know, I teach them, then, then they will change faster. But we need to find out where they are and then guide them step by step. Okay, number two, helping people to handle their life problem. So when people are facing family problem, the emotions, so we need to guide them. If a person has been having depression, you just tell him, okay, relax, forget about the past, just praise God and be joyful again. He will say, I knew that, but I cannot do it. So counseling is guiding them to understand the problem and guiding them step by step to change. So counseling is very important and it's very important to, for us to learn this patiently. Okay, number three, help non-Christians to handle their problems and come to Jesus for help and salvation. So uh, counseling is good for evangelism too. We can talk to non-Christians and then we listen to them and respond to them and guide them, help them with the problems and then gradually guide them to trust in Jesus to help them. And then helping married couples to have better marriage and family. Many couples, uh, they face marriage problem and that cause big problem to churches because if they fight with each other, they don't want to go to church and they don't want to love God more. So, and, uh, so that's Satan's way to destroy the Christians, the church, is by destroying the marriage. So we need to do marriage counseling and actually premarital counseling and dating counseling. We should do this too to help people when they are dating already. We tell them that you should come to the pastor and the pastor is not to change you. But the pastor is to guide you to find God's will. And then five, raise people up for ministry. So we need to raise people up to help people, to encourage them and find out if they are suitable for ministry. So we want to talk to them and guide them to grow, to have the motivation to serve God. And number seven, helping a person to change even if the people around them does not change. Uh, for instance, this person... He believes in Jesus, but his whole family is always yelling at him. 
always fighting him, then he has to change even though his family doesn't change. His family members don't change. And he has to change so that he has the strength to withstand the family pressure. So even when the family members don't change, he needs to change so that he is not affected by the family members and he can gradually influence the family members. Okay, the distance, uh, distinction between teaching and counseling. Teaching is suitable for people who are ready to learn and change. So they want to learn some skill, want to some, learn something, learn the Bible, then uh, teaching is good. Counseling is suitable for people who need help to handle this problem. So they have to handle certain problem and they have a problem with motivation. They need motivation. They need to guide them uh, to change. Then we need counseling, especially when they're not willing to change. And then sometimes it's, we need to find out if they can use the method they talk about to change or we suggest them to change. We need to find out, we, even when we come up with some solution, can you start to uh, pray for your member, uh, family members and pray for them and bless them and have compassion on them and forgive them? Can you do it? Some people say, I cannot do it, even though you tell me it's right, but I cannot do it. Then we have to guide them with counseling. Okay, and then number two, the difference uh, is teaching doesn't deal with feelings. It's just facts. Teaching is just dealing with facts. And uh, counseling, it accept and bring healing to the counselee's feeling. So it, we accept the people's feeling and we bring healing to the counselee's feelings. Counselee is the person being counseled. And then number three, uh, teaching tell people what to do and counseling guide people to understand himself and to find ways to restore his life. So it's not just learning something. To understand himself, that is harder. To understand where he is. So this is more personal. Counseling is more personal. To help him understand himself, to find out the problem and how to restore his life. Okay, now now I go into counseling first we want to talk about what we should pursue what are some areas of health that we need to pursue now some people think that health is just physical health or spiritual health but actually there is health in every area you see that if people have problem in these areas they would have problem with their life too first spiritual is most important so health it's in spiritual relationship with God. So first is spiritual health. Second is physical health. Now when people have physical illness, then it's hard for him to pray to God. It's hard for him to, to make friends with people and talk with his family members and help them. So physical health is important too. But physical health, now we can counsel people about physical health too because if the person doesn't take care of his health, then we need to counsel them and find out why their health is like that and how they can uh, uh, work on helping themselves to be healthier. And then number three, mental and emotional, thinking and emotion. So how can we help people with the mind and the emotions? Uh, that, uh, so the mental health means that the person thinking is healthy. Many Christians thinking are not necessarily healthy. Because they might think, well, God doesn't help me. I'm useless. I cannot do it. I'm not like other people. Other Christians, they have hope. I don't have hope. So this thinking causes his whole problem, his whole life to have problem. That his whole life is going downhill because he thinks he has no hope. So the thinking is important. And then emotions. If a person is always unhappy and sad and, or angry easily, then it will affect the whole person. And then there is health in, in uh, interpersonal relationship. That means that the person is, uh, can relate to people in a healthy way. That he can relate to people, uh, he can talk to people gently. Some people cannot talk to people gently. Uh, if they have any problem with the spouse, they have to shout. And they have problem with the co-worker, they have to shout. And even in the church, when they serve together with other people, when they don't get the way, they have to shout. So because 
they don't understand we can talk we can listen it's okay to listen to talk and to find out how the person the other person is and how to improve the relationship and then uh, fifth is environment appreciate enjoy and care for the environment and the situation that uh, a healthy person would appreciate God's creation appreciate nature appreciate the food he has so he has uh, a healthy relationship with uh, with the food, with the environment, with the situation, with his house uh, that's a part of health too if a person doesn't like anything around him then there is something that needs to be taken care of also okay and then number five uh, number six group group health that means healthy relationship in the family, church, friends and place now some people have problem relating to people at home and in the church now in the church it's easier than at home because in the church people don't have such close contacts and then in a home there is close contact for years so people know he has problems so people dislike him and so it's hard for him to relate to the family members so we all need to learn to relate to people and also relate to people who don't like us so much so how can we relate to them and uh, and in the church too, some people cannot relate to people in the church. They they keep a distance or they get angry easily. And then and then number seven, meaning and purpose in life, that we need to. Um, everyone when is healthy, then he has meaning in life. That he is happy, he's alive. He want to uh, uh, to have a goal in their life he want to pursue the goal of their life now if a person doesn't have a goal in his life then his life would have problem if he just think I just have money and, and live on that's all I want to do I just want to go to heaven and now I'm just waiting then they have no meaning in life no purpose in life so we want to help people to have meaning in life and purpose in life And uh, a person's health depends on three ability. First, his external and internal lifestyle. What it means is, if a person, you know, his, his lifestyle inside is always being angry, being sad, giving up on people and things, then there is internal lifestyle of despair. This has to change. Now, why do we talk about this? we talked about in the last slide about um, about um, health in this, um, different areas because when we counsel people we want to restore the health of these people in these different areas now even though we might not have time to go through all of them all of these er uh, elements but we need to realize that these are elements we need to work on for instance if someone is very active in church but he has problem relating to people in the, at home then he has to uh, this person has to be counseled to be able to relate to his family members so his internal lifestyle is how he thinks how he handle his emotions how he have motives how he has direction what to do and then external lifestyle would be like uh, how he sleeps does he sleep early does he eat well does he uh, keep his health so this is external lifestyle uh, this affects his whole life and then his support system support system from God and from people uh, some people don't realize they can have strength from God they just think I believe in God that's it but we need to realize that when we pray we can have strength from God when we read the Bible we can have assurance from the Bible so we need the Word of God to help us so we need to have the support system from God when he is despair he need God to give him strength and motivation when he has sinned he need God to forgive him so we need this support system from God some people have strong support system from God that they whenever you know they are attacked by people they call unto God they say God is helping me it doesn't matter if other people is against him 
Now for me, my support system is very strong in God. I depend on God all the time. I rely on Him all the time. I like Him all the time. I always want to have uh, strength from God. And I believe that He's giving me strength. And then from people, we need support system from people also. Now if a person says, my support system only from God, but I have no friend on earth, there is something wrong. There's something wrong because as people, we need to have relationship with people. If a person has no friend in the world at all, no friend in the church, no friend in the family, everyone dislikes him. Everyone doesn't support him. No one supports him. That he just uh, dislikes people. He stay away from people. Then he's not. He doesn't have a support system. When he is uh, unhappy, when he has sinned, when he has done something serious, or he has a divorce or family problem, then he has no one to help him. So we need to appreciate the support system we have from God and from people. We, we need to appreciate the people who are nice to us. We want to thank God for them. We want to thank them. We want to be nice to them to keep the friendship. Friendship don't come easily. In a whole lifetime, real friends, there are not too many real friends, you know, there, maybe there are friends around, they just chat, but they don't necessarily, they are not necessarily real friends because when we are in trouble, they might not help us and they might not be able to give us good counsel. So we need to have uh, friends that are supportive that, and also wise friends are very precious. So we, uh, we need to treasure the support system. And then three, the ability to handle different difficult situations. For instance, someone just yell at him, can he handle it? Now some people, when someone yell at him, immediately he will cry and he will uh, beat up people, he will throw things around, he would, he would quit his job, he would divorce his spouse. Now, some people cannot handle difficult situations. When he comes across a difficult situation, immediately he will break down. So we need to learn all these three, have these three, the external and sub internal lifestyle, his lifestyle is healthy externally and internally and he has support system from God and people he has good relationship from people to help him and he has learned the ability to handle different difficult situations this is something we have to learn uh, in one of the session before we have talked about how to handle difficult people so we need to learn to how when they are not not nice to us how we can learn not to be affected by them that we can still be nice to them and not be affected by them so this is something we need to learn and how to uh, relate to people and talk with them even when they attack us even they attack us we'll say okay i'm sorry if i've done anything wrong tell me what i can do tell me what i can change this way that this person is uh, peaceful to handle the difficult situation Okay, now, then as a person, the person being healthy, uh, there are different aspects. <coughs> Self-image and abilities. <coughs> Self-image and abilities of self is very important. <coughs> if a person has unhealthy self-image, Whenever someone says something to him, um, can you come punctually? He will break down. He will get very angry. He will cry. Oh, you're saying I'm late. I, oh, you don't like me. I will run away. I will go away from this church. I won't come back anymore. So they don't have a healthy self-image. People who have a healthy self-image, when you talk with them, even about issues, they can talk peacefully because they don't think suggestion as an attack some people think that suggestions are attacks suggestions are not necessary attack okay so uh, here as a social being as a social being we need to have health as a social being now some people say 
is this true? We do, do we need to understand these uh, psychological things? But let me tell you, the psychological things are found in the Bible. So let's look at social being. Is it found in the Bible? Ability to be alone in peace without fear of being left alone or feeling overwhelmingly bored. So here I talk about a person being able to be alone as a social being. We can relate to people and we can be alone. In the Bible, we can see that Paul spent long time writing his letters. Now he has to be able to be alone. And he can relate to people and he can be alone and doing his work. So he is a healthy person as uh, that he can handle being alone. Now some people in this new age now many people depends on uh, uh, games. They have to use a cell phone to play games and then when they don't have games to play, they don't have TV to watch, they will, they will say I'm very bored, I'm very bored. They will feel very unhappy. They have to have something they, they are uh, being uh, entertaining them. They have to have something that they enjoy and, and entertain themselves. That's not healthy. That Then they cannot read the Bible. Many people cannot read the Bible because they cannot be calm and peaceful by himself. And then at the same time, we can be intimate with people, able to have deep relationship with people without fear of being rejected. Now, some people, they cannot have deep friendship. They cannot talk about their deep needs. And they cannot respond to the deep needs of people. They won't talk about their own private things. They will keep the private things away from people. Now, I don't mean we tell everyone our secrets. We only tell the secrets to our friends, to the people we can trust, then we can tell them. But for other people, we don't necessarily tell them, uh, uh, I had a fight last night. Uh, there are so many family problems. Some people, they will tell everyone. I was fighting with my spouse last night, uh, uh, all this problem. And then they, because they just want someone to talk to you. And, but people won't like people like this because they, they will say, every time he talks, he just talks about his problem. It's it, not necessarily he will make friends. We want to be moderate, be able to talk to our friends about our real inner being, our feelings, like in my message, you notice that I talk about my feelings too, how I handle things. I talk in a personal way because I can relate to people, I can relate to myself. So the, as a social being, we need to be able to stay alone or relate to people and listen to people and care about people. Some people don't have friends. They cannot relate to people and make friends. That's not healthy. Okay. And then the ability of action, self-motivation to action. We can see that Paul has a motivation to action, to go to different countries, different cities, to preach the gospel and build up churches. So he has the self-motivation to action. He doesn't need someone to push him. We all need that. We all need that motivation ourselves to pray, to uh, work in a house, to uh, do the things in the house and to uh, build up a marriage and also to have the motivation to love God and serve God. We all need the motivation to action. Now some people have no motivation. They're not healthy because you see them they're always sleeping, they always fall asleep and they just, wherever they go they sleep and they have mod no motivation. They don't want to do anything. So that's not healthy either. So, and we notice someone, he doesn't want to do anything. There's something wrong. We have to find out why he doesn't want to do anything. And then creativity, the ability to create new ways to replace problematic ways. We all need creativity, although we have different levels of creativity. For instance, uh, if someone uh, works on a project at home or in a church, and then a machine breaks down, and then he would say, oh, it breaks down, oh, there's no hope. When it breaks down, he would just cry and give up. He has no creativity. What creativity? We have to say, okay, the machine breaks down. What can I do? Maybe I should go to 
take the machine to be repaired. Maybe I'll ask a friend whether he can repair it. Or maybe I can try to repair it. So he would find solutions to solve problems in life because in life there are so many problems. And uh, so if he has a problem with relating to someone, he needs the creativity to say, what can I do? How can I start talking with the person again? How can I forgive? How can I handle my inner emotions? We all need creativity in this sense. I'm not talking about creativity like drawing, you know. But creativity to solve problems, to relate to people, to do the things we need to do. And then three, ability to commit to oneself, to career, to personal relationship, and to group activities, and to be able to follow through with the commitment. So this is another ability of action, that he can commit to himself. He can commit to himself and say, I need to learn to do certain things. I need to learn if he has the interest to be to serve God uh, as a choir member. He needs to learn to sing. He needs to learn to read music. So he commit to himself what to do. Commit to himself to pray, to read the Bible, to serve God. And to career. Uh, whatever we do, we need to be able to commit to career. Some people cannot keep a job for longer than a few months or a year. Uh, they, w they are fired easily. Then there is something wrong with them. So they need to learn to be able to commit to career, to personal relationship. Some people cannot commit to a personal relationship. There are no friendship. They, they cannot relate to people. They cannot make friends with people. Then there is something wrong. Then they, they cannot do evangelism. They cannot have healthy relationship in the home. And to group activities. Groups include family, church, the workplace or other groups. And some people, they don't commit to the church. They just go to church and then they will leave as soon as the church a meeting is over and then they will leave because they have no commitment for the church. And they, some people cannot commit or they don't like to commit because they say, it's too much work. I don't want to commit so much. And then also to be able to follow through that they can say, okay, I need to finish the task. I need to finish my commitment to the family, to the church. So that's commitment too, that we need that ability to action. Okay, and then sense of self-worth. First, believe that one has self-worth, that we are not, we're not rubbish. Some people think they are rubbish, they are useless. Then they will give up on things. But we need to believe that we are precious, we are precious, we are important. So. Uh, when people have low, very low self-image, what happens is they, they cannot relate, they cannot build a healthy family, they cannot have good relationship with people, they cannot serve God, they cannot bring people to Jesus. And then believe that one can face and handle difficulties with God's help. Now some people when they face difficulty, they will cry, they will give up. But with the self sense of self-worth and self healthy self-image, he would say, yes, I have this problem. I need to uh, work on it. I need to handle the problem. So we need to have the ability to handle difficulties. And then three, accept one's past and as hope for the future. To accept our past is very important. Now, some people don't like to talk about the past. They say, my past is full of failure. I cannot talk about it. Now, even if we have a lot of failure in the past, we can say, I learned from the past, I changed from the past, and now I have improved and I've grown from the past. So we need to be able to accept our past and our future. Some people say there's no future. I, have, I cannot think of any future. I just wait for Jesus to come back or I wait for me to die. So they have no future. We need to accept that we are important. So we need to accept our present, our past, and our future. And then number four, God's love and acceptance give people self-image, self-worth. People need to learn to accept God's acceptance of them. So God's love and acceptance give us self-worth. Because God loves me, even though we might not have much education, even though we might not have much, uh, much money, or maybe we don't have much family support, but because God loves me, therefore I have value. I can my value can go higher and I can bless people. I, I am an important person. So God's acceptance gives us self-worth. 
But people need to learn to accept God's acceptance of them. Because some people, even though they read the Bible and say, we love because God first loved us, they cannot accept that God loves them. Because they say, I'm worthless. Nobody loves me. So far, no one in the world loves me. So God doesn't love me. So they don't accept that they are being loved by God. So they don't accept that they have any value. So we need to believe God's promises to us, that God's description of us. And then number five, self-worth is also built up when people build up their whole life. For instance, relationship with God and people, spiritual gifts, family. Now, our self-image is not just from God accepting us and loving us. It also comes from how we handle our life and help us to grow. If a person believes in Jesus, but everything he does, he fails. He fails in his family relationship, fails in his schoolwork, fails in his job. Yeah, he can never keep a job. He fails in a relationship in a church. He fails in prayer, uh, but he just believes that God loves him. He fails in uh, evangelism. Everything he does, he fails. Can he have a healthy self-image? No, it's very, very hard. But he, if a person is like that, if he fails in everything, the first thing to restore is not to build up success, but to build up the belief in Jesus, that my life is precious. Even though I fail in everything, Jesus loves me and He cares for me and I am important. So that's the first thing, that my life can go higher and higher. And then He start working on His life. So we don't first change our life. We first change our concept of ourselves and believe that God loves me so I'm precious. Now when I'm talking about this I hope each one of us are applying this to ourselves that we need to believe that we are important, we are precious and there is hope and there is God has a plan for us. So so we want to build up our self-image and then when we have God believe, uh, believing, in, believing that God gave us self-image, self-worth we also want to build up our ability to relate to people, to care for people, to help people, to talk to people. Some people cannot talk to people. To help people, to pray for people, to experience the Holy Spirit, to be able to preach the gospel. All this we need to learn. Then we build up a healthy self-image first from God and also from building ourselves up. Okay, and then as an experiential being, we all need to grow as an experience, experiential being too. First, we can accept our emotional experiences and does not suppress, ignore, or deny the emotions. Now, experiential means what we experience, and much of what we experience are emotions. We experience sadness, anger, frustration, unhappiness, despair. Now, we all have these feelings. The point is how fast we can handle it. Do we really handle these feelings? We all have been angry. If someone does something bad to us, we'll be angry. The point is, are we angry for one second, a few seconds, or a few hours? So we want to accept our feelings. Yes, I was disappointed. I was disappointed when someone was late. But then I want to handle it so that I don't continue to be, to be disappointed. That we feel sad when something, you know, someone hurts us or a friend leaves us. That's natural. But then we don't want to be sad all our lifetime. We want to work on it so that we can be happy even though our friends has left us. I can still have other friendship. I have God as my friend. So we don't suppress. Some people have feelings. They say, no, I don't. I don't. I'm not angry. But they are angry, you know. They, you know I'm not angry. You know, they're being angry. So we, we cannot suppress it. It's real. But we want to accept it and handle it so that we don't have to live in anger all the time. And some people ignore it. They're, they're angry, but they, they hate someone. They dislike someone, but they just do something else and forget about it. But the, inside the heart, they still have the anger. So we cannot ignore it and deny it and say, no, 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 no. I don't have anger. I don't have sadness. Then they cannot face it. Okay, number two, can experience joy and pleasure and at the same time can control our desires to pursue pleasure. Now some people cannot have pleasure, they have, cannot have joy, they cannot laugh. 
all day long. No laughing, no joy, no smile. They don't have the ability to experience joy because from childhood they've been beaten by the family members and they never, they're never happy and they suppress the feeling and after a while they lose the ability to be happy. So how, what can we do if we lose the ability to be happy? First, think of the things we like. The food we like, we say, oh, thank God I'm happy. I have this food. If I don't have this food, it will be much worse. But now I have this food, I'm happy. So learn to be happy because of anything. Or some people, some people are nice to me. I'm happy. Then gradually they can be more and more happy. Now some people, they have this problem of suppressed feeling. They don't have feelings at all. They won't have joy, they won't have sadness, they, their face is blank. So we need to be healthy. If a pastor just always have one emotion when they preach, is always being excited, then it's not a full emotion. We want to be able to feel all the different feelings and yet at the same time we can handle it. Okay, we can experience joy at the same time we can control the desire to pursue pleasure. Now some people cannot control that desire. They, all day long they just play with the cell phone, they just play games, they just have fun their ways, then they are not, they, they are out of control. They want to pursue fun and they are out of control. And then number three, you can calm themselves down and comfort oneself when facing difficulty. So this ability when they experience uh, unhappiness, they can calm themselves down. And they can comfort themselves. They can say, it's okay, God loves me. There are people who love me. I can put down this feeling of being hurt. Uh, God will heal me. I can be joyful again. So we need to learn to calm ourselves down to be a healthy person.